Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott McGovern, AIA, your 2021 AIA Baltimore president. I want to welcome you to the 2021 AIA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation Spring Lecture Series. The series brings nationally and internationally recognized speakers to speak about design in relation to a timely theme and to draw connections to relevant issues here in Baltimore. The lecture series is celebrating its 43rd anniversary this year. And we are proud that this year also marks the 150th anniversary of AA Baltimore, the Baltimore chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Founded in 1871, AA Baltimore is among the oldest AA chapters in the US. We represent nearly 1300 architects, emerging professionals, educators, and allied construction industry members united to demonstrate the value of architecture and design across our region. The lecture series is co-sponsored by the Arch Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Joe? Welcome everyone. And I am uh, Joe Salucci. I am currently the president of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. The mission of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation is to celebrate design in the built environment. BRF encourages people to explore Baltimore architecture and design, to be mindful of its history, recognize its architectural heritage, and appreciate its design innovations. BAF, through its tours, lectures, exhibitions, publications, and educational programs, demonstrates how ideas are manifest in the built environment and urban design of the city. Please join us in thanking our lecture series committee and welcoming our lecture series committee co-chairs, Kelly Dance, architect with Zigger Sneed Architects, and Randy Sovich of RM Sovich Architects. Randy? Thank you, Joe. On behalf of AIA Baltimore and BAF, thank you for joining us this evening. This wouldn't be possible without the generous support and partnerships of our sponsors um, offer. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of the 2021 Spring Lecture Series sponsors. As a major sponsor, and partner Maryland ASLA, supporting sponsor Oak Contracting, Price Modern, and Human Maryland Humanities Council as well, and our capital sponsor Shaw, our Corinthian sponsor Murphy and Dittenhafer Architects, I Ionic sponsors Plano Cudin, Mohawk, Texture, MRI, and Suzanne Frazier, FAIA. This series wouldn't be possible without their support and the support of AIA Baltimore's annual sponsors. We appreciate everyone's flexibility during this time of pandemic and look forward to seeing you all in person very soon. As Scott said, welcome to AIA Baltimore and BAF Spring Lecture Series. Manifestation is the theme. Manifestation, uh, architecture is a manifestation of culture. The series will explore how the built environment simultaneously reflects and influences culture in Baltimore and beyond. Each lecture will expose how cultural values shape design. The three lectures are focused around themes with specific local residents in Baltimore, a city in which the arts and culture are key to community, identity, history, and future vitality. Architecture and identity, art and architecture, architecture and social justice are the themes. Visiting and local speakers examine and highlight the built environment and its relationship with arts and the community initiatives, sustainability goals, preservation, equity, the vernacular, and more, as we reflect on how these have been shaped by design practice throughout AIA's 150-year history. The first lecture tonight is Architecture, Identity, and Place. Our speakers tonight will explore the overall theme and how architecture and the built environment are directly influenced by cultural values. It will examine this through the lens of community-based design initiatives nationally and planning specifically to Baltimore. The first lecture tonight, and I'll introduce all the lectures at, at, at once, but then they'll flow more easily. Stephen Luoni, Associate AIA, University of Arkansas Community Design Center. Stephen is Director of the University of Arkansas Community Design Center, UACDC, an outreach program of the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. Mr. Luoni is the Stephen Anderson Chair of Architecture and Urban Studies and a distinguished professor of architecture. Becky Slogaris, 
um, is currently, um, of MICA Social Design, is currently the Associate Director of the Center for Social Design at the Maryland Institute of College of Art, where she leads projects that bring students together with local nonprofits, private institutions, and public agencies to advance equity and social justice through design. Becky uses human-centered design to engage people in creating the places, products, and services that make them happy and healthy. And accompanying um, Becky are two of her associates, Quinton Batts and Vilda Olset. They are associates at MICA's Center for Social Design and graduates of the MA in Social Design program. As leads of the Center Made You Look initiative in collaborate, as the leaders in the Center for Made You Look uh, initiative in collaboration with the Maryland Department of Transportation Highway Safety Office. They work to equip communities with the tools that needed to create safer places for pedestrians and cyclists. Please see our website, AIA Baltimore, for each speaker's full bio. And um, before we continue, just a bit of housekeeping, there will be a form shared in the chat box for AIA and ASLA credit. You must fill in the form in order to re receive your credit. You were also emailed an evaluation form with the Zoom information. If you have not filled this, that out, please do so again with a link from the chat box. We will do a Q&A at the end of this, the lecture. Please use the Q&A box to submit questions. The chat box is for general dialogue. We will not be reading any questions from there. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Stephen. Great. Well, thank you, Randy. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Well, I, yeah, thank you to the Baltimore AIA for the opportunity to present our work. Uh, honored to uh, show you a couple projects um, for tonight. Uh, first, I want to expand a little bit on what Randy said, tell you a little bit about our center. Uh, we're only one of four or five teaching offices in schools of architecture nationwide. Uh, the University of Arkansas Designs, Community Design Center has been in existence for 30 years. I've been here for 17 years. We have our own facilities on uh, the downtown square in Fayetteville, about a mile from campus. Uh, and we are, our mission is essentially uh, to promote creative development in Arkansas through combined education design and research solutions. And that's what separates us from a, a commercial office is the combined services. And I wanna to get to that in a second. We have uh, a 12 month operating staff of anywhere from three to six uh, professional designers, architects, urban designers, and landscape architects. We also partner extensively with um, uh, our fellow uh, engineers and policy analysts uh, at the uh, university. And so we, we operate in a very collaborative way, not only with folks at, uh, and other departments at the university, but also with agencies, both local agencies and, and state agencies. And as I said, we're a teaching office where students essentially, much like a teaching hospital, work on projects with the staff. Um, but it should be understood that when you hire the center, you hire the staff. Uh, so we don't refrain from delivering professional services, uh, but the, the services we do concentrate on are really about promoting the commons and, and thus uh, the title reinventing the, the commons. Uh, I think it's important to understand that uh, the work culture of professions are distinct from other work cultures in the sense that the, the health of a profession is defined by its health with its publics, whether it's medicine, law, teaching, engineering, architecture, uh, all seen as uh, professions, all, all work cultures that grew out of the medieval guilds vis-a-vis uh, -vis the universities. Uh, it's important to understand that these work cultures not only are delivering services to a client, but in the, in, in the course of solving for uh, projects, we're also delivering uh, public goods. 
So design, health, law, and education as professions uphold the standards of uh, public resources and common goods, whether it's air, water, and forest, which is a common resource, or goods like knowledge, education, law, parks, roads, uh, public health care systems. Uh, the health of our professions are really related to uh, our relationships with the public. And I would say that, you know, we all understand this, that architecture and design disciplines are a little bit behind law and medicine. Medicine has a very healthy third party organizational infrastructure between practice and academia, like policy centers, uh, best practice centers, uh, teaching hospitals. I would submit, and I could do a whole lecture on this, that the design professions lag behind uh, because we don't have that third party infrastructure. We're still a work culture that's really still defined by the sum of its practices. And so when a doctor uh, is, is helping a patient through cancer, for instance, that doctor has the full uh, weight of a profession behind him or her in terms of best practices, funding, uh, policy, uh, therapeutics, where the practice itself is not solving for all these things, but it's the profession that's helping uh, to deliver services in this sense. And so that's really what I want to focus on uh, tonight. Uh, haven't, yeah, there we go. In the 17 years that I've been with the center, we not only have focused on solving for projects, uh, but we focused on eight areas, uh, placemaking models, in which we've uh, triangulated code, policy and best practices, and design solutions. So we've we tried to become experts in these areas, uh, working with our partners in uh, business and ecological engineering and law in the food sciences. And I'll show you two projects tonight, uh, uh, both in housing and food, urban food, agricultural urbanism. But we've also done work in arboreal urbanism, big box urbanism, context sensitive streets, low impact development, affordable neighborhoods, transit oriented development, watershed urbanism. These are all commons, meaning that uh, it's something that exists in between public and private sectors. Usually when we're trying to solve for public interest projects, we commonly think of uh, the public sector, the government as the source of solutions uh, to these issues. But in fact, um, the commons is a much more expedient way or more effective way to solve for these things. Uh, somewhere in between public and private. And I would submit that that's where design needs to focus is, its attention. The, the, the first of two um, uh, platforms that I wanna talk about is affordable housing and neighborhoods. And this sense of solving for housing, particularly for affordable housing uh, in our cities. And also I wanna, uh, uh, something that's important for you to understand is that most of our work is done for the 85% of Americans who don't live in the United States' top 50 downtowns. So essentially when architecture is talking about um, urban solutions, it's usually focused on large cities. Our work is focused on the low density metropolitan area, um, uh, consisting of small towns, mid-sized towns, rural areas, exurban areas, ed cities, suburbs, so we're really uh, solving for those kind of territories, which, which architecture culturally typically excludes. Uh, so this is, these are not really solutions for uh, the top 50 downtowns. These are for uh, the, the kind of diffuse territory that we live in. So in the housing, I just wanna run through uh, quickly through a, a series of projects which get to this idea of solving for uh, cooperative structures and housing, beginning with uh, uh, a, a homeless transition village uh, and solving for a deep homeless problem in our community. Moving from tent city uh, to a homeless transition village. And essentially, this is important because 1% of Americans every year experience homelessness. About 3 million people, 20 to 40% of uh, uh, 
that population will be shelterless. Uh, and so these are the folks that were that this transition village is solving for. And this is not done through the public sector. This is done through nonprofits. And essentially what this is saying, uh, having difficulty advancing the slides, there we go. Uh, with what every transition village prototype uh, needs are three things. First of all, the sleeping units, individual sleeping units, a secure perimeter, and then some area like the community ports where we can share services, uh, bathrooms, uh, showers, uh, offices, uh, warming tents, kitchens, places to gather. Uh, basically, these are the kind of services that uh, are delivering homesteading services outside of the cabins, which only have uh, heat and cooling. They don't have electricity. And so this is also not just about providing shelter, but it's about providing wraparound social services so that every six months we cycle through 20 new folks uh, and really use the village to help people uh, get back into employment, uh, find apartments, find housing. And so it's really a transition between homeless and uh, housing first policies. In our area, we can't do housing first, uh, which is a paradigm that says you should put everyone into housing uh, rather than prepare them for housing. Because we're a fast growing region and uh, at a 98% occupancy load, uh, we really don't have housing uh, for homeless. So these transition villages are proven to be important. So here's what the porch looks like. This becomes the frontage uh, to the street for the village itself, uh, for the cabins. Uh, this is where social services occur. This is also a self-governing uh, uh, transition village. So this is where uh, residents come together and uh, monitor their own village, help one another in uh, getting uh, employment and apartment opportunities and just taking care of everyday living. These are all services that are not provided by emergency shelters. So moving from the informality of the transition village, we published a book uh, several years ago on houses for aging socially, which is confronting this looming crisis that America uh, is um, at the tip of right now, which is uh, aging. Uh, 10,000 people a day in America will turn 65 uh, from now until 2030. We will double our uh, senior population and our healthcare system is not prepared for this. This is what the book talks about. The book talks about the triangulation of uh, aging as a set of factors, uh, housing, and also how to deliver medical services through real estate products like housing. Right now we do it through assisted living, through nursing homes. And so uh, because those kinds of, um, um, uh, those kind of tools will not be accessible to most of us who will reach the uh, senior uh, age in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, we really do need to prepare our housing stock uh, to serve uh, this, this demographic. So this is what this is about. And basically we flip the, the, the single family housing um, development on its head. We said, instead of seeing the house as something that's amenitized through a porch, garage, and a patio. We develop an infrastructure of, of uh, neighborhoods that start with the porch as, a, as an infrastructure, as a block long entity. We start with garage bars and patio mats as frontage and plug the house into these things. And so this is a way of setting up uh, shared living so that seniors uh, with some, some medical assistance uh, can actually uh, live an active life. Uh, they can still work. Uh, they can do an array of things that can't be done in other settings, including most suburban housing stock. Uh, so just to show you one of those, we wrote uh, throughout the book, we wrote something called the ecosystem of aging, 21 design principles towards a new cooperation. So for instance, in the porch, uh, the, the, the porch, uh, which occurs at the scale of a block, uh, becomes a kind of vessel or an armature for plugging houses into, whether it's detached, single family, uh, multifamily. The porch becomes the site of services. And much like a ship's deck, it becomes the kind of public 
area uh, where uh, dining can happen, uh, sociability can happen, uh, so that the unit is tied to the porch, uh, both collectively and in terms of uh, individual events that can happen on the porch. The porch can be screened, it can be glass for different climates. And so much like a ship's deck, it is the ultimate kind of armature for social functioning. Uh, it is also the, the point of delivery for um, medical services that can be delivered at home. Uh, here's a transect showing the relationship between the private unit, semi-private space, and the porch. And with the garage bars as well, uh, looking at the kind of uh, American neighborhoods before World War II, informal neighborhoods which had economies in them, so the house supported uh, cottage industries. Same thing with the garage. The garage can start out being a parking space for cars, but it can also become shops, become uh, studios, it can become offices, um, books, booksellers, coffee shops. Um, it can be gardens. Uh, so the garage at one time, 60, 70, 80 years ago, was uh, a kind of informal site where many things could happen. Many, you know, a lot of urban neighborhoods would never waste their garages on parking a car. So this is an attempt to bring informality back into uh, a senior living environment where work and a sense of purpose uh, becomes part of the, the neighborhood. And in, in finally round, rounding out the, uh, uh, our investigation in house, and we moved to what's, what Daniel Parallel calls missing middle housing. Missing middle housing is the uh, scale of housing that exists between an individual single family unit and uh, large apartment flats. Uh, missing middle housing uh, involves duplexes, all the stuff you're familiar with, carriage houses, ADUs, fourplexes, mansion apartment, bungalow courts, uh, townhomes. The great American city uh, before zoning of the 1920s was built from missing middle housing and the educated contractor that used pattern books. And this was a great way to make urban neighborhoods affordable. Uh, it allowed people to age in place. And the units were, uh, diverse units were very accommodating to the needs of families uh, and households as they changed over time. What's important about the missing middle house is that it still reflects the familiarity of a single family house that can accommodate anywhere from two to 20 units and still have a comfortable fit with single family neighborhoods. We stopped building and financing this housing after World War II. And basically we're seeing a resurgence of this housing as a way to create walkable communities and affordable places in small mid-sized cities. Uh, so this, is, this, this now gives us uh, a choice between single family and large apartment flats. What we did was use this housing and a kind of housing first urban regeneration plan for uh, the country's second uh, fastest shrinking city, which is Pine Bluff, Arkansas. We uh, developed neighborhoods of missing middle housing that would bring downtown back uh, so again, it's a housing first regeneration plan where you don't start from uh, commercial or tourist attractions or the kind of signature projects that cities have always uh, used to regenerate downtowns. Basically, we're creating uh, a livable place for workforces who want to once again uh, live downtown, but can't afford it. What we did was develop 28 types uh, ranging from some single family to duplex all the way to 12 unit multiplex uh, and are working with the city uh, to open source these plans so that uh, we can give immediate permitting, uh, by right permitting to any property owner that wants to build what we've ascribed as far as housing for their site. So it's a way for the city to get the kind of urbanism it wants to see uh, so that we can uh, as, as we plan housing with public spaces and other mixed uses, it's not just about planning units, but it's about housing delivering multiple service, uh, childcare, commerce, uh, recreation, 
Uh, this is surrounded by parks. So the neighborhood becomes the main vector of regeneration. These are multiple multifamily townhouses, uh, anywhere from two to four units in each townhouse. These are live work swing spaces in case we can't get commerce to come back to this once thriving downtown. Uh, this is by the way, 80% uh, African-American. Uh, the turn of the 19, 1900, it was the fourth wealthiest African-American community in the US behind Charleston, uh, uh, Richmond and New York City. Uh, and that was from a study done by W.E.D. Dubois, E.D. E.B. Dubois, uh, turn of the century. Um, so this was a community that worked, Delta community that worked for all income groups and all races. Uh, and the idea is to bring these kind of residential settings uh, back to the downtown. I wanna quickly go to food. Um, we, even though uh, our mission is to promote creative development in Arkansas, we've worked around the world. Uh, and I wanna show you a project that we've been working with the Department of Agriculture for the state of Hawaii for the last three or four years. Uh, but it started out with the food city scenario we did for Fayetteville. And all this work is online. You can see the reports. This was funded by the Clinton Global Initiative. But basically, we asked the question, what if Fayetteville had to support itself from a food network grown within its city? So what would a city look like if it had to grow food uh, within the city? Uh, and so looking at short food supply chains, we found out that the city needs four types of infrastructure. One is a nutrient management infrastructure. That is, uh, how do you take um, the soil into place and make it healthy again for, for growing local food? Uh, we looked at growing media, at wetland farming, at hydroponics, at different ways of delivering food. Um, you know, or, or growing mechanisms like uh, thermal gardens, which is in the report. We looked at third, waste recovery infrastructure, our wastewater treatment plants to create uh, industrial energy uh, districts where inputs from one kind of food producer could be inputs for another. Uh, and then looking at food processing and distribution, which is one I wanna talk about tonight, the missing middle of food looking at those food hubs that Big Ag uh, tore down or made useless over the last uh, 100 years. And you're familiar with the food hubs. Uh, you've seen those in Faneuil Hall, Reading Terminal in Philadelphia, uh, Pike's, uh, Pike's Place Market in Seattle, uh, Eastern uh, Food Market in Detroit. Uh, so we have a South, South State Shreveport in uh, New York City. So these kind of remnant food districts uh, which served and once ran by cities, uh, served their regional food sheds. And that's really what we're trying to reintroduce into Hawaii. Keep in mind, Hawaii uh, is uh, the most remote land occupied population center on earth. 93% of its food is imported, uh, which means it's deeply food insecure. Uh, food is expensive because it has to be imported. Uh, usually from the mainland because, because of the Jones Act, they can't import food from Asia. Because of the Jones Act, you have to unload food on a ship in America, put it on a domestic ship and float it back to Hawaii. And so basically we're uh, working with Hawaii to redevelop its food system, to localize it. Uh, and that means uh, we're developing three things, especially for the island of Oahu where Honolulu is, it's uh, uh, close to a million people. Uh, developing a food hub in the central Waiwa district, which is the agricultural uh, uh, growing areas between the mountains. Uh, so a food hub, um, uh, a value added development product center, which is basically a food innovation center for the university. Uh, so that food becomes a kind of economic development sector and then base yard prototypes so that we can process and package food on site at remote farms. Uh, the, here's a 35-acre uh, food hub that uh, we're proposing for Waiwa, which is just about 25 miles of Honolulu. This is basically a logistics center, uh, which is about bringing uh, agricultural product from the island and value adding that, you know, so bringing cabbage here and creating kimchi 
and then packaging that kimchi and mostly making it available to uh, residents on the island, but some for export, uh, mostly back to Asia. But we found with the food center, uh, with the food hub, it's not just about providing uh, the uh, areas for processing food. These are really market makers. So while these may uh, incorporate retail or farmer's market, a food hub is not a farmer's market. A food hub is a facility for market making. So we're aligning uh, large scale producers uh, with uh, consumers, uh, large scale consumers, wholesale, like the military, schools, uh, grocers, uh, restaurants. And basically with COVID, what we found in America is that America is deeply food insecure because 54% of our food is consumed away from home. And we found that out uh, when COVID happened, all of a sudden, 54% of that food that was supplied by farmers, farmers had to end up destroying that food because they were a one customer farm. And so food hubs, food hubs are kind of brokerage, a way of aligning consumers with, uh, with, with, with demand, uh, supply and demand. And food hubs would be the kind of switching mechanisms for when one kind of uh, supply or demand shuts down, it can open up in a resilient way, a realignment of supply and demand. That's what we were missing with COVID. And of course, this was started four years ago uh, before COVID, uh, but we're finding that, that these are much needed. So we not only have a food hub, but we also have a place for tenant food producers, workforce housing uh, for ag workers uh, who are deeply impoverished. Uh, so the state wanted to build um, commercial centers and housing, the support of food industry. And this not only was a logistics landscape, but it also had to be a neighborhood center. Uh, this is all built out of uh, concrete tilta, uh, which meets um, Food Safety Modernization Act standards. Basically, we had to build facilities that were uh, clean enough that you can build chips in, semiconductor chips, that's where food is headed. Uh, so, but we also had to make this amenable to tourism and a neighborhood center. So really making tilt up uh, uh, um, for programs that can accommodate a visitor center, education center, uh, viewing bridges, uh, because we can, because of food safety, we can no longer bring folks through uh, food production facilities. Uh, we also have housing integrated with uh, the food tenant commercial sector, housing for ag workers. Ag workers on average make about a fourth of uh, the median income of a typical household in Hawaii. So most of, many of them are homeless. Uh, so this is a way to rebuild the agriculture sector, not, the level, not just at the level of supply and demand, but also to build a skilled workforce, uh, to network the agricultural workforce and build a kind of economy around food. Uh, we also had to build a, a footbridge and bicycle bridge across the canyon, uh, connecting downtown uh, with, uh, with the food hub. And so it's not just about logistics, but it's also infrastructure and logistics making place. So we provided a botanical garden as we move across the canyon uh, for this foot and bicycle bridge uh, most agricultural workers are zero car households, so they get around by bike and, and, and foot. And so this was a much needed infrastructure to connect downtown uh, with this large scale employment center. This would be a three shift center. Uh, and then in line with that, looking at the food innovation center that is a mile away from here in downtown Waiwa, uh, this is really uh, an effort uh, to get the universities in the food innovation game. Not many universities are in it. Our university is in this game and served as consultants. But basically it's about taking agricultural waste stream and innovating products, whether it's pickles, uh, baking, a distillery, um, cosmetics, oils. Uh, there's already this kind of cottage industry in Hawaii, but it hasn't scaled. And so basically what this is doing is building a facility for the University of Hawaii uh, so that they can develop a food innovation curriculum and then uh, develop industries around this that would then go to the, uh, to the food hub. Uh, this is just a, a repurposed metal building 
about 35,000 square feet. And basically these aren't food scientists anymore. These, the, the, the catchment student area for this are designers. This is really a design curriculum. Uh, so it's no longer a kind of linear, the positive, the positivist uh, food science of, oh, these are designers coming in, inventing food products and then uh, commercializing them. So we built a university or proposed to build a university uh, structure that supports that. And then rounding this out, uh, we also built uh, base yard post-harvesting processing centers uh, from shipping containers so that farmers can uh, process their food and be compliant with uh, the new Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, which by the way, there's the prediction that the, the new FISMA, or Food Safety Modernization Act, will put 30% of farmers in Hawaii at least out of business because of the cost of compliance. So this is a project to help uh, uh, farmers maintain their livelihood and thrive through uh, adding value added services, including you get, uh, uh, tourism and food process. And then rounding that out, coming back to our own campus, as we consulted with folks in Hawaii, building a food and farm entrepreneurship for our own campus, uh, in which we can take um, the second most food insecure state in the country, Arkansas, which ironically uh, is also one of the top agriculture food producing states in the country. And that's a whole other story. That's why we did Food City. But developing a community-based uh, innovation center where we invite the community in uh, through banquets and food demonstration uh, conferences to celebrate uh, the kind of economic development uh, and, and the kind of food stuffs that can come out of uh, agricultural waste streams. And I just want to leave you with this. This is really important. Uh, I always thought uh, that design was enough uh, to solve for our larger problems, but there's something that we have to internalize into our design thinking, and that's that social problems are ecological problems. And, and th th this comes out of the book by Offner. I think it's called The Challenges of Affluence. And basically, we have issues that come from affluence. Affluence breeds impatience. Impatience undermines well-being. The market's eclipse of institutional sectors is hampering our ability to, uh, to work as a, through design and through comedy. And indeed, the rapid pace of novelty is overwhelming. Commitment frameworks that come from institutions. We have the privatization of choice. It displaces the moderating forces of social counsel. And these are all problems of the commons. So we have to look at political and social decision making and internalize that into our design projects uh, so that we can solve for these grand challenges that we're facing. Uh, once again, thank you for having me. I look forward to our discussions. Thank you. Awesome work, Steve. Thanks for, for sharing that and looking forward to discussing a little bit more about it together later on. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky Slogris, and I'm here with MICA's Center for Social Design. And what we're going to share with you tonight is a case study called Made You Look and talk specifically about design as if people mattered. And I know I am preaching to the choir here. Um, so excited to, to share this project with, with you all and talk about it later on. So I am the Associate Director at the Center for Social Design at MICA, Maryland Institute College of Art. And our center is dedicated to demonstrating and promoting the value of design in advancing equity and social justice, as well as to inspiring and preparing the next generation of creative change makers. And social design, to, to define it for us tonight, is a creative practice that is dedicated to understanding social problems and then supporting positive social change. And we use human-centered design as a process. It is a collaborative, creative process that really aims to understand people's needs and design interventions that better serve those needs by centering people through everything that we do. So just to give a little bit of context before we go into our case study, I wanna share why, why human-centered design? Why should we care about using this process? The first is that it truly involves people in every step of the design process. 
So it's not just having folks come in um, and sharing input at the very end. It's encouraging them to be a part of the research, part of the ideation, um, part of every step of the process. And because people are involved in every step, it then opens up the potential for new ideas, new ways of doing and making. And ultimately, we believe that it results in more meaningful and valuable outcomes. And I like to keep this graphic in mind whenever I think of human-centered design because it is, it is tricky and hard to involve people in every step of the design process, but it is always worth it. It is always important. And when we talk about design, I want to have you all think very liberally about it. So Steve just shared a lot of design in the built environment. When people think of social design, they often think that we're just doing graphic design. Um, but in actuality, design can be uh, products like this, this toolkit for older adults around here in healthcare. It could be designing a space or an experience like this pop-up event that we created with the Baltimore City Health Department to encourage Baltimore residents to create smoke-free homes. It could be a service like this uh, mobile farmer's market for Real Food Farm that brings fresh food to residents around Baltimore City. Or it could also be more abstract. It could be designing a system like this um, approach to communication that we crafted with the Baltimore Campaign for Grade Level Reading that is encouraging them to communicate through trusted service providers and community leaders to families instead of connecting with families directly. And the process that we use is called a double diamond. You'll see as I go through each phase that the diamond shapes start to come together in the center. And it is a series of divergent and convergent phases. The first phase, frame and plan, is where we are taking everything that is um, available to us around our, our partner, our project, our topic, and we're trying to figure out where we specifically can intervene as designers, given the skill set of our collaborators, of our stakeholders, given our timeline, given our budget, and we craft a, a very specific uh, but still open-ended design challenge for our work. From that, we then diverge and we do as much research as possible, becoming sponges to learn as much about the topic as we can, but really researching with people, hearing their, their thoughts and, and getting more qualitative insights, not just quantitative. After the research stage, we then converge again, we bring it all back together and we uh, take what we heard from the research and help that drive what the opportunities are for design and where we should focus our attention. Once we have those sort of key insights and key opportunities for design, we then uh, diverge again and ideate. And we invite people to, to join us in thinking of as many ideas as possible um, using the, the concept that no idea is a bad idea, just getting all of the ideas out there on the table and then figuring out which ideas are worth prototyping. And as we prototype, as we make with people in the real world, we are then able to refine and take our prototypes, narrow it down to a few different interventions that are worth actually implementing and then iterating. So the process is also never done. There's always improvements that can be made, as you all know. And while it looks very linear, it can also be messy. So don't let this graphic fool you. Um, this is often a process that uh, can jump from stage to stage, or maybe at some point you realize you need to go back to research or you need to go back to synthesis. So just uh, like Steve and his center, our center is, is really straddling education and practice. And we do that through a couple of different initiatives. The first is our, our one-year MA in social design graduate program. The uh, practice-based studios that we offer are available to all students at MICA. So it can be students in the MA program, or it could be a painting major, or um, an undergrad student who is interested in game design. These are credit-bearing courses that are open to any student, but done in collaboration with, with partners. So um, there is the safe environment of having uh, faculty and staff who are there to support uh, students in the in the fields and, and learning as they go. 
once uh, students go through our MA in social design program, we have the opportunity for them to stay and do a postgrad associate um, ship with us. And that that is our attempt to kind of bridge that gap between education and practice. Um, just like Steve was saying, knowing that students are often thrust into the field and while we might not be doing uh, stuff that is as life and death as surgery, it is at the end of the day really critical if systems are designed equitably for people or if, if they're designed in a, in a way that is inequitable and without people at the center. So our postgraduate associates stay on after their, their time with us in the graduate program and are embedded into projects around the city. And, we, bridging education and practice, have many initiatives called impact initiatives that we are working on that extend beyond the academic calendar, knowing that social change does not fall neatly into 16-week semesters. We have longer-term projects that happen. Some can be as long as five years, six years, um, and that's, that's our, our way to keep those projects going in collaboration with our partners. And the project that uh, you'll learn about today, Made You Look, is one that actually spans all four of these buckets. So you'll hear from Bilda and Quinton. They started as students in our MA in Social Design program. The project started as a practice-based studio, and they are now in um, year two of their postgraduate associateship running the Made You Look initiative, which is one of our long-term impact initiatives. The partners that we work with range uh, from some private partners to public partners, lots of work in Baltimore City with different city agencies, as well as nonprofits. And the case study made you look that we'll be sharing tonight is a collaboration between our partners at the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration and the Center for Social Design. And it's a collaboration that began three years ago and has really blossomed into something really special. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Quentin and Vilda to tell you more about made you look. Thank you, Becky. Uh, greetings, everyone. Like Becky mentioned earlier, my name is Quentin Betts. I'm a social design associate with the center. Um, I've been on since 2019, postgraduate. And um, I'm originally from Dinwiddie, Virginia, located uh, 45 miles south of Richmond. And hi, I'm Vilde Ilset. Um, also a social design associate, graduated from ASTI in 2019. And I'm originally um, an urban planner from Norway. <laughs> But then, um, nice to see you all. So back when we were students, as uh, Becky mentioned, in 2018, when we started working on this project, um, the project title was, or still is, Behavioral Change for Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety. And we started by like understanding the data or understanding the reasons why, like why are we, why is this important um, to work with in Baltimore City? And we learned that in 2018, there were in Baltimore City, uh, one crash every 30 minutes, one injury every hour, and one traffic related fatality every week. And um, in addition to this, so pedestrians and, and bicyclists represent over 20% 20, 20 of those fatal traffic crashes. And one third of the pedestrian injuries are people under 19 years old. So it's been really important for us to, to work with youth and you will see when we present further um, to hear the youth voices and work with people, hear the perspective of the, of the youth community. Um, this is our initial project area and for the, uh, for the people in Baltimore, um, you will recognize to, on top there's North Avenue um, the MICA campus is in the middle and um, south, like the south border is um, Utah Street and Preston Street. Um, and this area was chosen obviously because it's the MICA campus, but there was also when, in 2018 when we started working, there were also a lot of initiatives go, um, happening in this area at the same time. So the North Avenue Rising had their 95% design uh, finished and we're, they were doing community outreach and they have 
since then uh, almost finished the construction and then the um, uh, Mount Royal bike lane and re street scraping of Mount Royal Avenue um, was happening at the same time. And then this map shows um, the, the clusters you see in green and red and yellow are where the traffic accidents happen and the, the red areas are where there, are, there have been fatalities. So, and, so North Avenue uh, has the majority of them, but also but to the uh, south of North Avenue in the, in the right hand corner, there's um, several MICA students actually got killed uh, while, while walking the street or crossing the street at night uh, on their way home. Um. And as Vilda mentioned earlier, um, working in that project area that we were in surrounding MICA, it also borders a lot of neighborhoods. And we wanted to make sure that we were very inclusive about how we were entering these neighborhoods and, have, and getting access to them. So we appointed some advisors and brought them along on the team. First, we have Jasper Barnes from uh, Bike, which is a local uh, organization in Baltimore. Uh, that works with the youth on bike mechanics and uh, it's also a mentoring organization. Uh, Graham Carell Allen, a local uh, public artist who specializes in uh, road, road, right of way art installations. And then we have Akia Jones. He's a local uh, Baltimore resident, also a student at MICA, and he's the owner of the More brand, a local uh, brand of Baltimore uh, clothing. And then we have our last, Michael Bowman from Formstone Castle. Uh, it's a design firm out of Fells Point. Um, you probably look, um, if you're from Baltimore, you've locally seen his work um, every year at Light City. And uh, these advisors have been with us throughout the project. And um, this is how we started our work, listening to people, talking to people. We wanted to know what were people's really pain points and um, what were their daily routes of travel every day. So if you see in this first picture, this here is at Mount Royal Elementary. Um, it's actually walk to school day. Um, we do this uh, every year before uh, the pandemic started and uh, it was a great activity for the youth. They loved it. Uh, we brought a map out and we let them pinpoint um, their way to schools, where they live and how they got there being if it was a uh, bus, car, bike, or, or anything. And um, this activity really let us see where the hot spots were for them and how they felt on their way to schools. And it happened, it just so happened to be that a lot of the areas that they pinpoint and the areas of transit that they use were already pinpoint hot spots through um, neighborhoods that we've talked to on the map, but also the data that we um, got from the state of Maryland. So that was also um, a good relief to see that we were moving in the right space with um, the area that we were working in. And the rest of these photos, are just us walking around, talking to residents, and uh, really getting a sense of um, their pain points in the neighborhoods and um, what they wanted to actually see done in their neighborhood. And then we um, continue to attend community events. Um, we went to a lot of uh, community organization meetings. We, um, we also attended a lot of lighting events that happened. And, um, and then this last picture is from the uh, Signal Station North Lighting. Um, and this is a project that's happening along North Avenue, along with North Avenue Rising that, um, that keys in on lighting and non well lit areas. And then we started talking to people. So um, this is some of the things that we heard after speaking to people after year two and year one, after we had a more focused uh, view of where we were headed with the presentation. Uh, we heard from safety advocates around the city that conflict happens when a pedestrian is somewhere where drivers doesn't expect. And if you're from Baltimore City, that's key and common. Um, Baltimore City is known for people owning the street and walking across the street uh, when they feel like it, um, and which should be a, a right for, for walkers in the city. And the second, from a local nonprofit director, um, in the ideal world, there will be a magic fund that installs lighting throughout the city. Kids stay out late riding with their bikes. My biggest concern for them is their visibility. And this is something we heard um, in a lot of the inner neighborhoods that we're working in now because they are very bike heavy, especially Green Mile uh, West, um, where a bike is located. And um, last, when speaking to a, a city uh, leader, they expressed Baltimore roads are built to prioritize the movement of cars to and from the county. And that's something that um, we've heard a lot when speaking to local residents in the, in the city and um, finding out their ways and modes of transit 
because uh, most Baltimore city residents actually don't have a car and they use bus or bike for transit. And then after gathering all those, uh, we created insights off of all that information. And the first one we, um, we came up with was pedestrians who disobey traffic rules are criticized, but rule breaking is also required to affect the cross the street. Just as I spoke of earlier, uh, pedestrians are always seen in Baltimore having to run across the street for traffic um, to try to catch the bus. Even so, if it's a crosswalk there, the lights may be timed wrong, or it's just the danger of people running red lights, which is a thing here in Baltimore City. <laughs> and the second insight, drivers are expected to be aware of pedestrians, but often don't see them because the infrastructure does not support clear visibility. School zones are especially prone to this issue. And um, that's something that really came up through year one and two. We had the opportunity to, uh, to test that premise uh, year one with the Mount Royal Elementary School. We uh, did a traffic study and were able to change the pattern of traffic and create a safe passageway for children entering the school. And three, by prioritizing those who drive in and out of the county, the city creates a less safe environment for locals who often do not have cars. And this is still playing on the fact that um, it's very hard for pedestrians to really get across the street, get to bus stops, get to transit they really need because most areas are very, have bus stops will also have light rail, um, light rail uh, exits. Good. Last, road infrastructure could be improved to enhance pedestrian and bike safety. But people don't feel their voices are being heard by city agencies. And this is the last component of uh, what we heard from, from people that really wanted to take insight and make sure that we really had that rooted into the project. Because um, when speaking to local community members, they felt like their community officials and uh, their elected officials were not listening to what they actually wanted done in their neighborhoods and they wanted to actually find a way to get the information to them quicker. And then next, um, we took these insights and invited all the, all the people we had spoken to, all the partners of the project, um, back to these shareback sessions. So uh, invited them to ideate with us and also give feedback on the prototypes. And out of this process um, came the Major Look uh, initiative. And our mission statement became, um, how, how might we make sure um, that pedestrians and bicyclists are both seen and prioritized? And for us, um, this is on two levels. So uh, firstly, make sure that pedestrians and bikers are seen while they're walking on the street, but also that these local safety concerns are, are seen or heard and prioritized by policymakers in the city. Um, we formulated uh, this term road equity to describe what we're working towards. Um, and Jasper, one of our community advisors, is demonstrating how uh, school children have to uh, risk their lives crossing the street to, to get to the bus stop, going back and forth to school every day. And then road equity in this picture would, would mean to balance out the power dynamics between the car and the pedestrians. And, put in infrastructure for, for other road users to also be able to use the road safely. We also created these uh, design principles to guide the work. So the first one is to promote, promote mobility as a human right and advocate for road equity, inspire change by engaging community and uplifting safety concerns, um, and then prioritize cooperation and collaboration and work towards simple and sustainable solutions. And these last two uh, are very important to us because we knew that we, we could, wouldn't be able to make lasting change without having co collaboration um, with other partners in the city. And then uh, under the major look umbrella, we have these four initiatives, so reflective gear, uh, the underline, bright lanes, and the toolkit. And Q will tell you more. And our first intervention, reflective streetwear. This started from the idea of creating reflective clothing that would be high visibility at night, but also be cool to wear for people. And um, through year one, this is something that we, we tested and got feedback on and, and heard what people liked and what they didn't like. But from what we got from that, we understood that people would actually wear reflective clothing that lit up when lights shine on them, but they had to be cool. 
It had to be something that they deemed that they liked and, and, and the idea came up that they created themselves, they would feel ownership over it and would want to wear it. So this is something we tested out. This is here's bike. Um, we did a, a workshop with them where they tested out all different types of reflective things that we had, sprays, attachments, just to figure out what works and what we needed to change. And that was a great experience. They loved it. And um, some of the kids still use some of those things today. And this is us further testing that premise. This first picture is at um, Safety City. Um, this, we, we set up a table and um, we let the kids design their own reflective safety vest. And um, this activity was something they really loved. They got to practice with uh, different types of reflective tapes, 3M materials, and then any other material that they felt that needed to go on there. And uh, the kids got creative and it was a great activity that they loved. And um, that's something that we, we would like to continue in the future if the opportunity stands. And this second one is from Village Learning Place. This is actually with bike. And um, they got to actually do the second part of their workshop where they were just testing what the idea could be like. Then they actually got to get to create that idea. And this is here with them screen printing with reflective ink. But this ink is made the same way that the paint is made on the road. So it has tiny reflective glass beads and tiny shards that reflect when light is shining on them. And it implicates the uh, same technology that the road lines have. But that's something that uh, we felt that will work very good for the project and uh, was also very cost efficient. And the students loved it. And that, read, that moved us on to figuring out how can we mass produce this? How could we get this out even more? And if you're familiar with Baltimore, this is the infamous uh, Micah sweatshirt. And um, if you can see here, this sweatshirt is actually reflective. Um, it has the 3M printing of the micro on it. And um, at, night, at nighttime, when headlights shine on it, it lights up. And uh, this is something that we hope that uh, micro students, uh, community members, and because micro has a lot of avid bikers that's, that's uh, in this community. So uh, we really want them to be able to adapt this and uh, we want it to be equitable. And um, the next, when you order those, they come with this tag that we created that gives you information on the project. And it shows you why you purchased that item and, uh, and why you should wear it. And, uh, this, and it also comes with a reflective tag that you see on the right, where it could be attached to bags, uh, jackets. That's a uh, part of the project that, that we uh, tweaked and through, uh, through our feedback workshops that people wanted attachable things that could be used in multiple ways. And that birthed the final iteration of what our reflective streetwear would look like. And that brings up our collaboration with the Be More brand and Made You Look. And uh, this is our Made You Look capsule that uh, came out through the Be More brand, the local uh, Akia Jones, who is our, our fashion advisor and uh, also a local Michael student and resident. And um, this, this has been adopted and loved um, since it came out. And these are currently available. We have five different colors. Um, if you want to hear more information on that, uh, I can gladly link you to that uh, uh, after the presentation. But uh, these have, since they came out, they've hit the streets and started running. Uh, people love them, all ages. So that's something that um, we would really want to uh, keep to keep uh, moving uh, into the next year. Maybe some cold weather stuff, or we know some cold, we have plans for cold weather stuff coming. But uh, stay tuned for that. And second is the Baltimore Underline. And this came from the idea of if we had that imaginary fund where all of these scary places that we could just light them up. And uh, that's this, the Underline is a demonstration. It explores how light can enhance pedestrian and bicycle experience in non-well well lit areas. Uh, and if you're not familiar with this place, this is uh, the North Avenue underpass at, um, at uh, Mount Royal in, um, in Howard, that middle part. And uh, if you're not familiar, this is a, the, the expressway. People are coming in and off from I-83. It's a lot of traffic, high volume. People are running across the street to catch the, uh, catch the bus. There's also a light rail uh, uh, stop um, on the other side. So then we knew this was an area that was highly dangerous for students, uh, for residents, for anyone interacting with this space. So we, we created an idea of lighting that space up where it stays lit during the daytime and night, but it's also interactive. Uh, it has a, a, a black light uh, lit mural on the back, where, which would be like a community collaboration on the piece where it, it restores what was already there. So when we walked the space, we figured out and seen that there was a social justice mural there. And uh, we, knew it, we, only, we knew that it only made sense to restore what was there. 
So um, that project luckily has been funded and uh, that's gonna happen with the help of Central Baltimore Partnership. Um, and it's, it's gonna uh, enhance to all of the projects that's already being done on North Avenue. And um, hopefully you'll hear more about that project coming soon. Um, so to the third uh, intervention project, um, Bright Lanes, is really about providing visual cues to drivers uh, to tell them that pedestrians are there and these are pedestrian zones. And we started out prototyping this with the Monroe Elementary School. So first with spray chalk and then uh, later we um, partnered up with a striping company that uh, gave us real traffic paint. <laughs> To, to do uh, their pedestrian walkway in the parking lot um, permanently. And then uh, year two, we expanded our project area and we started working more directly with, uh, with neighborhood associations. And uh, this is in Greenmount West, right outside OpenWorks. And when we uh, started talking to the Greenmount West community, uh, they had all, we learned that they had already uh, kind of identified this location as, as a dangerous intersection um, and uh, gotten a grant to do work here, but they had given up in the process of navigating the bureaucracy. So it gave us a chance to kind of come in and pick up where they left, um, which is amazing. We hosted a series of community design workshops, both with youth and with um, adults in the community. Um, and um, this is how the bright lane looked when it was installed last spring. And um, the youth uh, translated the stop sign, so the hexagon patterns are the stop sign and um, that they translated to the ground as a way for them to say to cars that they should slow down and give them space uh, to be there. Um, and then for us, really, this project was about learning the process ourselves because the, um, so the whole idea behind the DIY toolkit is that many residents and many all advocacy groups that we talk to in Baltimore City want to do these kind of interventions themselves but often um, give up as Green Mountain West Community Association had done because the process was hard to navigate. So the goal of, of the toolkit is to make it easier to understand. And we've divided it up into five steps. And um, um, I think the next slide is a sneak peek of how it looks like inside. But this year we've really been working with Baltimore DOT on creating this toolkit and then um, we're ready to publish early next month. And then for the for the remainder of uh, or till, till summer, we'll host a series of training sessions to go along with this toolkit and then hopefully um, there will, Baltimore communities will be able to, to do these kind of interventions um, themselves. And then uh, I'll read this quickly, bear with me. So the major look project at a glance, 50 gallons of paint, 111 reflective shirts, 25 community collaborators, one graphic designer, one freshly painted bump out, 10 share back sessions, eight newsletters, four project advisors, 150 gram Instagram followers, three online surveys with 213 responses, four community design workshops with 80 participants, one community toolkit, 20 community events, 15 community association meetings, and one map with 100 sticker dots identifying areas of concern for pedestrians and bicyclists. And then um, before we end, I, we want, I wanted to go back to the title. So in design, people matter. And then of course we hope that these interventions will create change and create a safer Baltimore for pedestrians and bikers. But then um, the other aspect which we haven't uh, talked about, but which we have noticed very much is through, so three years ago when we started talking to people about pedestrian bike safety, everyone um, seemed to blame someone else for not having done their job properly. And it was, uh, nobody thought we could really make big change in Baltimore City because it was impossible to work in Baltimore City. And then through kind of using this human centered design process, like really bringing the lived experiences into focus and, and putting importance on that and then um, inviting or do inviting into to this collaborative process through the through the sharebacks 
now every time we have a share back some there's someone that comes with a new idea of a project we can do together or something they would like to collaborate on or and it, it keeps growing or someone asks um if they can invite their someone they know to to the share back sessions and kind of seeing this uh, family grow and um like we wouldn't have been able to do anything without the partners but i think this putting the people in the center of the process creates this shared set of values that fosters collaboration instead of blaming each other for who's not doing their work. So I, thank you. The last slide that says thank you, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Stephen, Becky. Quentin and Vilda. Um, I'd like to first ask, um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists if they have any questions for each other. Yes, I have one for Becky's group. Um, wh what's your relationship with the Baltimore city engineer? Great question. I'm going to pass that one directly to Vilda and Q. It's been, it's been up and down, but now I would say we have, we have a really good relationship, but then um, in the beginning we said things and we offended a lot of people and kind of managed to work through it. And, yeah, but then now it's, it's been great to work with it. Yeah. And, and how did that happen? I mean, how, how did you get um, agreeability? Communication. Um, I think that's what it was, communication. Uh, we set up a system of check-ins and um, created a relationship that really wasn't there. So we uh, started having meetings with, that brought in the Baltimore department with the Maryland department, with the state office. So uh, we was getting people in rooms together that, that had never been together. So it was creating dialogue and people getting to step out of their, uh, their normal box and think more creatively. Wow, that's that's impressive. So rational discourse actually changed minds. It was that easy, huh? But it's been three years. So. Yeah, yeah, three years. Yeah, that's that's the power of getting people in the same same physical space, same room, or same Zoom room, um, and just doing it consistently. I think so that people know that this project is is happening. It's not going to go away. Um, that we're committed and that they can count on having these check-in moments with one another um, instead of uh, complaining about each other and getting frustrated with each other. They, they sort of have a space that is facilitated where they can come together around these shared goals and really problem solve. So, so a follow-up question, um, to, 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 to what extent does this become comedy? What, what, to what extent has it left you and other groups start to take this on and, and kind of spread the thinking about living streets. The, the, I feel like all these projects have happened because we found collaborators, right? So, so we haven't done any of these projects by ourselves or in silo. And then, so in many ways they're, they're living by themselves uh, already and then um, now all our work kind of this spring and hopefully next year is how can we hand this off and who do we hand this off to and how so we've always been thinking about how can this project live without us in a way and yeah. 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 impressive work I um I see a, a question in the the Q and A that I think is is great and one that I would actually like to hear. Steve's response to as well, which is how do you how do you respond to people who might be suspicious of your motivations for working in their their neighborhoods, and how do you develop trust? Um, I think for us, it was a lot of community meetings and continued conversations and just showing up. But I, I wonder if that's something that you encounter as well, Steve. Oh yeah, from uh, not just from the bottom up, but from the top down. Uh, I'm I'm not from Arkansas, uh, and so. Uh, that that can be an issue sometimes. Uh, yeah, probably talk a little too much 
like a Yankee or, 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 or a cross. Uh, so I think it's just persistence, you know? I, um, yeah, yeah, you're not, it's not only important to listen. I mean, listening buys a lot of goodwill. Plus you learn a lot as, as, as you guys are, are rightfully saying. But, but persisting, right? Knowing uh, what, what, when people know that they've been heard, uh, then they're more willing to engage a uh, solution being co-created with an expert. Uh, but it can't be an expert kind of uh, coming in top down. Um, and, and, you know, uh, especially in Hawaii, I mean, people looked at us with a lot of suspicion uh, because we were brought in by the state. Um, most people have never been to Arkansas. They don't know why Arkansas was in Hawaii. And, um, you know, we, we went back to the drawing board a lot of times and not only listened, but actually responded to uh, different, you know, different uh, um, feedback uh, from people, you know, wanting to know how this is going to fit within their community. And so it was a very long political process, but I think listening was, a, uh, was the gateway. Mm -hmm. I, I really responded to what you were saying about listening can only do so much. Listening is great, but then you also mm -hmm. have to follow up. And I think one of the things that we struggle with is remembering to update everyone that we've talked to and, and how important it is to keep them in the loop so that they are able to see that this thing you talked about a year ago, or maybe even two years ago, it has actually happened. It took a while, but it has actually happened. And we did listen and, and really closing that, that loop is, is um, something that I think we often forget, but is so important. It, something I'd like to add to that, um, you know, ever since the sixties and, and, and with Berkeley, I mean, designers have been taught uh, the community participation is, is, is really the most important thing. But I, I would say we need to qualify that. We need a more sophisticated sense of, of who the public is and what the public is. Uh, because the, the, the biggest form of community participation has been NIMBYism over the last many mm. decades. And it's not really, uh, it's not really uh, a broad-based constituency, but it's uh, uh, interested neighbors. And that, that has shut down so many projects. And, and in Arkansas, we find the state has basically three kind of sectors to it. You know, there's, there's Fayetteville, which is like, kind of like Berkeley, uh, where everyone's smart and above average and thus has something to say. So every community meeting's like a thousand people. And it's really hard to, uh, to get things done and, and to get agreement. Then you go to Little Rock, the middle of Arkansas, central Arkansas, and um, not many people are gonna show up, right? So you had to figure out how to work through a kind of representative logic. And then when you go to the Delta, um, people will only work through um, uh, representation. You know, so communities won't show up. That, you know, it's either their pastor or a banker. You know, <laughs> those are who you work with. And uh, so, the, the, there's three radically different ways of working, but they all represent the publics, you know, and there's different ways that the public manifests itself through the, through the process. So um, I, I would say that design culture needs to figure out a more nuanced way to understand publics. There's a question for, there's a question for Vilda. It's uh, what's your evaluation plan and how do you know what, um, know your project is working? Maybe she might want to. Uh... That's what our MDOT partners. <laughs> <laughs> We're, um, we've done a lot of um, questionnaires or surveys along the way. So we've been uh, evaluating continuously. So for the streetwear, we've, we've asked for direct feedback on, um, on the streetwear continuously and kind of used that as an evaluation. And then for the, um, for the bright lanes, we developed this observation tool. We went out and did pre-observations and we're going out to do post-observations. Um, but we also did kind of a questionnaire or survey to the, to the residents. And I think, so did we slow traffic down by installing flex posts and painting the street? Yes, we did without quantifying it or without knowing it. But then um, what we got when we sent out the survey was 
the kids are are so excited about it they they go there and that's where they like to play when they when they go outside and all of a sudden it's become this much more than a, a, a street where you are afraid to cross in a way so um, will, you, will you will you evaluate the data um like i think you said 1200 people died in a in a year from a traffic accident will you evaluate that um in some way to see if there's been a, a measurable impact yeah, I, I was thinking about that when I was putting together the slide. Like, this was in 2018, now we're in 2021. It will be interesting to see um, the data now. And yeah, and I, but I think the, the crash data, the specific locations, the specific intersections, and right. see, see if that changes. But um, I think overall the data are going up and down. And we, I think one of the cool things about this project is that we do actually have a uh, data analyst from the Maryland Department of Transportation who is on our core project team and he's able to help guide us through that and, and really unpack the data. Um, also doing uh, sort of crosswalk visibility enhancements is a best practice that uh, Federal Highway Administration um, has as one of their, they call them this spectacular seven countermeasures. And it's a really accessible and, and fairly inexpensive way to, to create safer places. So that's, um, our work is building on the, the best practice and research that has been done in, in other places around creating uh, right of way artwork. I'm gonna jump around on these questions. Um... Steve, Steve, uh, affordable housing uh, often is uh, affordable because it's subsidized. And so there's a question about the affordability of your projects. Um, and so how, how do you kind of reconcile that? I, I know the cost in Arkansas is a little bit different than maybe in a big city. Mm -mm. Yeah, well, it, take the homeless transition village. That's, um, that's gonna cost around $850,000 to build and probably about $150,000 a year to, uh, to, to operate. Um, so over five years, it's, it's been given a, a temporary provisional uh, permit by the city to do in town. Uh, so over the five years, that's going to be what, uh, you know, uh, uh, $2 million, let's say two, $3 million. Yeah, we have 800 homeless individuals. It costs local governments $30,000 a year for every homeless individual. I mean, we're, we're, we're in the tens of millions of dollars. So while some initial estimates were, wow, this is a you know, million dollars for a homeless village is essentially a camp, that's a lot. What it saves is incredible. So I think that's another way to think about it. Our missing middle housing in Pine Bluff uh, was designed for the market. Uh, you know, it's around 110 a square foot to get the market back in, right? This is a weak market city. Uh, and the, the, the delivery of services from that, uh, getting people back into downtown and living downtown uh, is also going to carry with it uh, a lot of residual multiplier effects. Uh, so the, the, the kind of housing we've designed uh, is really just in line with the market. And this is not public housing. We've also provided projects for subsidized public housing from our housing authority. But this is, again, uh, workforce housing uh, to, to jumpstart small scale markets within those cities. And so this goes back to the middle. Again, it's not just about public or, you know, or, or the kind of high capital end of the market, but it's about getting the missing middle of all these sectors back into play. You didn't talk about transportation, but you have projects that have to do with transportation. And Becky obviously has spent a lot of her team with transportation. You had some um, some data, uh, Steve, when we talked earlier about the impact of uh, mass transit on on the cost per family. I think that was kind of an interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we did two major ago. projects over the last 10, 12 years. One is a proposal for light rail development in Northwest Arkansas. We did a book on that. Uh, which shows the metrics on why, since we're a fast growing region, albeit we're small, but we won't be in 20 years, we'll be well over uh, a million. Uh, and then we also did a, a proposal for a streetcar development in Fayetteville 
also a fast growing city. And basically uh, we're the second poorest state in the country. And basically what we said to our local governments, this is just not helping people to move around more efficiently, but because the average household in Northwest Arkansas spends 29% of its annual income on transportation. Uh, keep in mind the average in America is 19% of household income is spent on transportation. In a city like Baltimore, where we actually have rail transit, the average household uh, expenditure is 12% of its annual income. So we're, we're at the top of the nation in terms of expenditure on transportation that almost a third of the income are moving around. And so we say, this is a prosperity building program if you get the transportation ecology correct. And the ecology factors in, you know, buses, uh, cars, trains, scooters, bikes. It's, you know, the, all, the, all the modes. And it also gives us other benefits as well, like downtown revitalization. So uh, everything we're talking about, you know, Becky's group, same thing with context sensitive street. I can't think of a better way to uh, generate economic development in Baltimore than to retool its streets. Okay, Becky, there's a question, I think it might be for you. It's about, um, are you aware of the complete streets bill? I, I'm not. And Yes, yeah, no, if, if you are in Baltimore and you are not aware of the Complete Streets Bill, please check it out. It's, um, it's amazing. And um, I'll, I'll see if, if Filder or Q have anything else. It's, it's hopefully going to bring a, about some of those changes that Steve is talking about in our city that really put pedestrians and bicyclists at the center of our streets instead of cars. Uh, build IQ, anything you want to add about complete streets? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. We love uh, the, the work that they're doing, and we've been in contact with them since uh, around year two, I believe. I think it was probably year one. Um, but we've been in contact with them because they they um, like the the way that we went about um, collecting our feedback and the way that we collected our data on the maps. So um, they really were looking for a way to strengthen how they did their community outreach. So that we were in a lot of conversations with them on um, how we went about collecting that data. I'll we'll see if I can find minutes. a link to it really quickly and I'll put it in the chat box for everyone. Uh, bo both uh, organizations have um, funding from the um, federal government and privately, I guess, or state and federal. Maybe you could each talk about your funding sources a little bit more. There's questions about funding. Who wants to go first? Uh, yeah, I'll go for it. You know, so so our center is around uh, uh, annual budget around five hundred fifty six hundred thousand. Um, Two thirds of that comes from the university. Uh, we are very lucky. We have a rare university that sees the design center, and its school of architecture is uh, one the, the premier program of the university. Even though uh, we're one of the uh, smallest uh, programs, in, and and by far. Uh, the, the least productive or the least wealthiest, let's say. Uh, so uh, this comes directly from the chancellor's budget uh, around uh, close to 400,000 a year, plus the space, they provided this space as well as the renovation to do it. Uh, so we've, we've been very fortunate to have a succession of, of chancellors that um, uh, see what our center does is important and we're subsidizing. Out of 50 centers at the university, we're the only one that receives such, such a budget item. Um, yeah, so our, our center is a little bit different in that all of the projects that we do are sponsored. So we run them through MICA's Office of Research um, where they are either course buyouts or, or long-term projects that are, are funding associates like Q and Vilda to continue working on the project um, and actually funding the, the sort of center itself and our staff and our, our people. And I'm just curious, and, and so who, who paid for this, for the, your, the project that you guys presented tonight? Who paid? For so this is the, the one and only the amazing Maryland Department of Transportation and their, their support over the past few years when we started Working with them, um, they were interested in seeing what art and design could do, but I think also a little skeptical. And it's been so cool to see the partnership continue. We are 
we're um, at the end of our third year of, of grant funding with them to, to do this work. And so- and Did they come this, to you? It was, a uh, yeah, they were interested in doing work around Micah and, and having uh, Micah help with designing and, and developing different uh, interesting approaches to, to education. Um, one of the, the questions I saw in the, the chat box was um, if we had considered doing stuff that's more infrastructure based and our, our grant that's funding us is actually strictly education. So we are pushing the boundaries and as far as we can to, to do as much work as we can that is, is actually um, making strategic changes in, in public space. Um, I think that we are at the end of our time. I, there's still a lot of questions, um, and I'm sorry we can't answer them. There is one question I saw, maybe, um, Steve, there's a question about your book, and if you, obviously, if you get a plug-in for your book. Oh, yeah, the house is very... On the, scene, on the, on the aging. Yeah, yeah. And how they could get it. Uh, that'd be great. Um, uh, Amazon, uh, all three of our commercial uh, available books, Amazon, uh, 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 the Conway Urban Watershed Framework Plan and our bestseller, The Low Impact Development, which is uh, ecologically based stormwater management uh, are all available on Amazon. And if you have any books or any uh, shirts that you want to bring up, Becky, this is your chance how to get a hold of these shirts. They look great. Yeah, I, I saw Q actually just dropped in the chat box a link to the, the Be More brand reflective shirts. You can also get them at the MICA store. Um, and if you uh, have interest in, in following the Made You Look work and the work of the Center for Social Design, you can follow us on, on Facebook and, and Instagram. And we, um, we, we keep all of our, our projects updated through social media there. Thank you very much, everyone, for um, all four of our panelists today, and uh, we really appreciate it. Also, I have to um, bring up again, uh, once again, thank you to our Spring Lecture Series sponsors, uh, and thank you to our annual sponsors that are listed on the screen. A big thank you to Steph, Steph, Steve and Becky, Q and Vilda for continuing to make this series a reality and access in the digital world. I'd also like to remind everyone that our next event is a lecture on the 31st of March titled Art and Architecture. And our first lunch lecture is next Wednesday at noon on Zoom featuring local uh, artist Van Haum, um, which is not up on the screen, but you can find it on the website. So please don't forget to um, fill out the form for credit because you wanna get that AIA credit. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Yeah, thanks, great, great meeting you guys.